Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's message. I'm Eric, the lead pastor of South Mountain Community Church. Thank you for taking just a bit of your time to be with us today. Uh, we exist for one reason, and that's to help as many people as possible take their next step towards becoming fully devoted and fully delighted followers of Jesus Christ. And I know that for so many people, church and even religion can be messy and oh so complicated, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here you can belong before you believe. So our hope is that your first visit with us is enjoyable, meaningful, and unlike the church experiences of your past. We also think that the best way to experience delight is with others in person. So SMCC is about more than just a Sunday sermon. We have five locations for you to choose from where you can connect with people in authentic community. We want every message you hear to engage your head, your heart, and your hands for a life of full delight. So with all of that in mind, enjoy today's message. All right, well, uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name's Trevor. I serve as one of the pastors here at SMCC. Just wanna say thanks for joining us today. And uh, today I'd like to talk about a particular subject together over the next 25, 30 minutes. But uh, before we get into that, I wanna open up with a story. And the story is all about a father and a son who lived in this kind of farmstead home out in the countryside, right? And uh, at a certain point in this boy's life, when he was getting into his early teenage years, he was starting to have uh, some difficulties with a temper, pretty nasty temper that kept flaring up several times a day to the point that the dad began to say to himself, this is a significant issue. I need to somehow help him through this. And so the plan that he devised was basically to give his son these instructions. Every time his son would lose his temper, he wanted him to uh, take a hammer and a nail and go ahead and hammer a nail into the fence out in front of their house. And the very first day the boy put these instructions into practice, he ended up hammering in almost a dozen nails into the fence. But just like that, he began to realize, man, I'm losing my temper a whole lot more than I even realize. And he himself began to see that it was an issue that was affecting his life. And so as day after day passed, as he began more aware of it and began to kind of deal with it more, uh, all of a sudden he started putting in fewer nails and fewer nails and fewer nails until one day the first day came where uh, it went and passed and he didn't put a single nail into the fence. Not that he didn't get angry at all, but he didn't lose his temper. And so the dad told him at the end of that day, all right, well, uh, you didn't put a single nail in today, and so now what I want you to do is go out and remove one nail. And now, moving forward, every single day that comes and goes without you putting in a single nail into the fence, I want you to go, and at the end of the day, take one nail out. And so, several weeks passed, and as time moved along, eventually it got to the point where the boy had removed every single nail in the fence. And on that final evening, when they went out together and he removed the, the final nail and they kind of stood back and looked at the fruit of their labors, the father took this opportunity to kind of impress upon his son the final lesson he wanted to on this particular subject as they saw before them a fence that was completely chock full of holes. The lesson is this, what anger does can't always be undone. What anger does, what anger produces, or rather what we produce when we're in the midst of anger isn't something that can always be reversed or redeemed or undone. I think the truth is a lot of us know that by experience, right? We've felt that, times where we ourselves have been angry, maybe even lost our tempers, right? In some relationship, whether it was something that happened at work, maybe a family relationship with a parent or a spouse, a significant other, maybe we even lost it on one of our kids, but in some way we blew up and the result was something that couldn't immediately be repaired. It couldn't be Fixed, And I think for that reason, anger is one of the most difficult emotions that we have to manage. And for that reason, the question I wanna explore together this morning is just that. How do we handle our anger well? It's an emotion that marks so many of our days, so many of our relationships, that we feel it in so many different contexts, and yet so often it can be so difficult to know how to navigate it well. And so how do we handle our anger, well, 
That's the question I wanna explore together today. And so as we do that, we're continuing and actually bringing our series, The Chosen, to a close where we've been looking at some of the most gripping passages behind some of the most compelling scenes that mark the show that is called by the very same name, The Chosen. And so today is our final entry into this series and we're looking at a passage that tees up this subject particularly well, the subject of anger. So what I wanna do is kind of stick to our format where we read the passage and then we watch the clip and then afterwards we dive into the subject together. So the passage is Luke chapter nine, verse 51 uh, to 56. So I'll go ahead and read it for us. You should be able to track along up on the screen. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to join me there. Uh, Luke 9, 51, and then we'll watch that clip together. It reads like this. As the time approached for him, for Jesus, To be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned, rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Rabbi, ah, you couldn't wait, could you? Oh, sorry, we just uh, wanted to clear a few things up, if that's okay. By all means. You Jewish boys are far from home. Yes, as a matter of fact, we are. Shalom to you too. Here's our traditional Jewish greeting for you. Don't lift a finger. That was a warning. Try it again and see what happens. Quiet, Big James. Shalom to you too. You filthy dogs! I said quiet. Let us do something. And what would that achieve? Defending your honor. They reviled and humiliated you. They deserve to have bolts of lightning rain down and incinerate them. Yes, fire from the heavens. Fire? You said we could do things like that. Say the word and it will happen. Why not? We knew we couldn't trust these people. We shouldn't have come here in the first place. They don't deserve you. Why do you think I had you work, Melek's field? What was I trying to teach you? To, to help? You think it was just to be more helpful? Or to be better farmers? It was to show you that what we're doing here will last for generations. What I told Fotina at the well, and what she then told so many others, it's sowing seeds that will have a lasting impact for lifetimes. Can you not see what's happening here? These people that you hate so much are believing in me without even seeing miracles. It's the message, the truth that we're giving them. And you're going to get in the way of that because a few people from a region you don't like were mean to you. That they're not worthy? What, you're so much better? You're more worthy? Well, let me tell you something. You're not. That's the whole point. It's why I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rabbi. As we gather others, I need you to help show the way to be humble. We will. You wanted to use the power of God to bring down fire to burn these people up? Well, it sounds a lot worse when you say it that way. (laughs) You too. You're like a storm on the sea. Come on. Thunder exploding out of your chests at every turn. (laughs) In fact, That's what I'm going to call you from now on. James and John, the sons of thunder. 
So uh, hopefully you can see why that is a particularly helpful passage and scene for delving into the topic of anger. Because first, you've got these random bypassing strangers who respond to them with such hostility, such hatred and anger. And then James and John, they, they respond with this explosive anger. And then Jesus responds in anger as well, but not in alignment with them, but rather against them in a way that challenges them and teaches them, right? There's a whole lot of anger moving in many different directions in this passage, which is why I think it's the perfect one to help us to discuss the very same topic ourselves of anger. But before we jump into it, I think there's one kind of curiosity that I wanna lean into. And maybe the question you're asking yourself is why were these strangers so upset with them to begin with? Right, where did this animosity, where did this hatred come from? And, and to jump into that, I really wanna answer one question, which is who were the Samaritans? Because if you look at the passage, you see that they're passing through uh, a place called Samaria, and there's more than meets the eye going on within this passage. And so just to give a quick history on this, uh, what took place is uh, back at a certain point in Israel's history, there was one kingdom that all 12 tribes of Israel, they were united under one kingdom. And then at a certain point under the reign of one of their kings, that split into two, into a northern kingdom that 10 tribes were united under and the southern kingdom that had two of the tribes. And then fast forward a couple more hundred years, in 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire, the world superpower at the time, wiped out entirely the northern kingdom. And they had this policy, the Assyrians, of basically resettling anyone that they had conquered, taking them out of their own land and resettling them somewhere else, specifically in order to weaken their identity. And so they did this to the northern kingdom. And so Samaritans developed out of the mixed bag of people, of those who kind of dodged or were left behind in this resettlement, and also people groups, other conquered people who were resettled in the northern land of Israel as well. Through that mixed bag of people arose the, the people group that we know of in the first century as the Samaritans. And so because of that, they still considered themselves the people of God. They could even trace pieces of their lineage back to the people of Israel. And you can see that in different things that Samaritans say throughout the New Testament, like the woman at the well that Jesus talks to in John chapter 4. But at the same time, they had a shorter, a smaller set of scriptures, different worship and religious practices that separated them from the people of Israel. And so when you get into a first century context where this took place, you see that Israel, uh, you've got the region of Galilee in the north and the region of Judea in the south, right? And this is where the people of Israel are. And then right in the middle, you've got Samaria. And there was this intense hostility that existed between them because to the people of Israel, to Jewish people, Samaritans were not Gentile. They weren't completely non-Jewish, but they absolutely weren't Jewish either. They were somewhere in between and for that reason, they rejected them. And the animosity and the hatred was intense, it was severe, and it went both ways, as you saw within the scene. And I think if anything, what we see is this relationship between two different people groups that is defined by religion. And what that tells us, what we can see in this relationship and this hostility is that religion produces self-righteousness as well as other unworthiness. Religion produces both self-righteousness and self-worthiness and on the same time, on the other hand, other unrighteousness and other unworthiness. And if you go back in this first century context, you see that parts of it are cultural, parts of it, parts of it are ethnic, and parts of it just have to do with the religious practices that each group has. And these kind of form and fuel this hatred that they have towards the, the, each other. Right? And, and religion is what is producing that for each of them leading them to understand themselves as worthy, which is exactly what Jesus calls James and John out on, and the other as less than, as unworthy. And the truth is, right, while it may operate according to slightly different details, religion is still very much at play today. And it still produces the same thing. And oftentimes it works like this. If you can keep the right rules and live according to checking the right boxes, right? If you can just kind of fulfill everything that religion says that you're supposed to do, then you are righteous, you are 
worthy in the eyes of the community, in the eyes of God, even in the eyes of yourself. You are righteous. But if you fall short, if you misstep, if you're not able to check every box, then all of a sudden you are unrighteous, you are unworthy. And when this is the way that you've been taught to lead your life, to understand your life, the lens through which you look at it, it also becomes the lens through which you understand every other person, separating them into categories of worthy and righteous and unrighteous and unworthy. You can see the kind of damaging effects that that would have upon relationships and community, the kind of hatred, the kind of animosity that that would stir up. That's exactly what we see between the people of Israel and the Samaritans. So going back to the passage, what was typical in the first century, because the animosity was so intense, is people would actually travel around Samaria when going from either the north to the south or the south to the north, just to avoid interacting with them. And yet Jesus rarely did what was typical. And instead, as we see here and in other places, he chose to travel directly through. And so jumping into the passage for just a little bit, this is what we see. Luke chapter nine, verse 51. He chooses to travel through Samaria as a Jewish man, and this is what happens. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Now, real quick, Luke is using some language within this passage that uh, is something that you see consistent throughout his letter, that he's talking about Jesus approaching the time to be taken up to heaven. And what this means is that the time where Jesus is moving about more broadly in his ministry has ceased. This is a turning point where he's moving more directly to Jerusalem in order to die, to be lifted up on a cross, to be buried, to rise again, and then to ascend into heaven. And Luke is framing the story in that particular way, that Jesus is heading to Jerusalem to die. And that's what he's getting at in the framing. And then afterwards we see that Jesus passing through Samaria led to some consequences, that they did not welcome him. And in a way, that's kind of a gentle way of him phrasing it. And I think the truth is when you see James and John's response, that they want to call fire down from heaven and to have these guys incinerated, that shows that it wasn't like they were saying there's no more room and uh, you know, hope you find a better place somewhere else, right? That this was a more offensive rejection that I think the scene does a good job of kind of depicting. And then, so they're rejected in that way and then we see this take place. Verse 54, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, saw this rejection, saw this humiliation, saw this disrespect, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and he and his disciples went to another village. I, you can see the self-righteousness exploding, bursting forth out of James and John in this scene, because they think, as Jesus said, because they were mean to you, people from a region that you don't like were mean to you, and you think they should die on the spot, because of that, this is the outworking of you rendering yourself righteous and them less than, unrighteous, less than worthy. And he rebukes them on that account. And I think what's interesting is when you see it in other people, it can be so clear and easy to identify. And yet, the truth is oftentimes we have the same things at play within our own lives. For example, when I first started uh, trusting in Jesus, I remember being uh, in this kind of church gathering and there was this woman who shared this story uh, where she was at church one Sunday and she was walking down the hallway and she saw another woman that she knew from the church come in the other direction. And so she went to say hi to her and yet the other woman, as she walked past, she didn't say hello, she didn't uh, give her a nod, she didn't look in her direction, she didn't even give her a glance, she completely snubbed her. And the woman telling the story talked about how in that moment she was so offended, she was hurt, she was livid, and yet she thought in the very next moment she just turned to God in prayer and said, well, Lord, vengeance is yours. She was expecting God to come through, 
in a particular way. And I think you see the same thing at play there in her heart that we see with James and John, right? There's some self-righteousness and some other unworthiness. She was trying to bring God into it and get him to do her dirty work. (laughs) And so in the passage, you see that with James and John. And the truth is, uh, they ask about this specific instance of fire coming down from heaven because it's something that happens within the Old Testament, specifically with the prophet Elijah. And so they're thinking, if it happened then, it can happen now. It should happen now. Jesus has been disrespected. He's the Messiah. He's the one who's gonna overthrow the Romans. He's a military leader. Surely he won't stand for such disrespect. He is gonna show these Samaritans who's boss and what he is capable of. And instead, in that moment, Jesus turns and rebukes them. An action that is surely wrapped up in the emotion of anger Itself. And I think for that reason, sometimes anger can be difficult to know what to do with because James and John are angry and they get rebuked for that or at least rebuked for what they do in their anger. But Jesus is also angry, so it can't be that anger is always wrong. But how do we know when anger is good and how do we know when anger is wrong, right? It's complicated. And I think the truth is that sometimes in dealing with the complication with it, what we end up doing is just sort of stuffing it just sort of taking our anger and bottling it up, thinking, you know, I'm not sure what to do with this. I don't wanna handle it wrong. I don't wanna harm someone. I don't wanna say something that I'm gonna regret later. And so I'm just gonna take my anger uh, that's kind of slowly bubbling under the surface and I'm just gonna stuff it down and bottle it up. As soon as I feel my temperature rising, I'm gonna hit the mute button on my anger. But the thing is, you can't mute anger without muting anger everything. You can't mute the emotion of anger without muting all of your emotions altogether, including joy and including sadness and even including connection. So many of the emotions that give us the ability to connect with one another, if you mute anger, you mute all of them and we lose so much. So I understand why at times we turn to that specific direction, and yet it's not the most helpful route. And so in answering the question, how do we handle anger well, I wanna just bring in one other passage that I think uh, rounds out the conversation a little bit. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Um, This is the Apostle Paul, a leader in the early church. He's writing to the church that is located in the ancient city of Ephesus, what is now modern day Turkey. And he's given some instructions broadly on how they are to interact with one another. And in this section, he addresses anger. Ephesians 4.26, he says this, that in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. What he's getting at here, some have taken it to mean that, okay, don't let the sun go down while I'm still angry. That means that uh, I need to resolve all conflicts and put an end to all anger before I go to bed every single night. And so if you've ever had you know, a conflict arise with your significant other, at 9.45 and you typically go to bed at 9.55, that means I gotta work this out fast. We need to put this to bed before we put ourselves to bed and that is not always the easiest thing to do. And for that reason, I wanna be clear that that's not actually what the passage is getting at. It's not that literal. Rather, what it's saying is uh, allow your anger to be there for an appropriate amount of time but not longer because it is possible to continue to nurse our injuries, to revisit our offenses, to uh, to sit and stew in our anger in such a way that prolongs it in a way that is unnecessary, in a way that continues to make uh, more broad the breach that has taken place in the relationship that makes it more difficult to actually bring about the repair that is needed. And he's saying, don't do that. But at the very beginning, if you notice, the phrase was, in your anger, do not sin, which means it is possible to be angry and to not sin. The question is, how? And I think if we're just to break a couple of things down with anger, it helps make that more clear. For example, one of the key ideas when it comes to anger is just that anger is a secondary emotion. Anger is an emotion that is always secondary, meaning it always rides in the back of some other emotion that is first, that is primary, that is foundational. And anger always arises out of 
that primary emotion beneath it. In a way, it works a lot like an iceberg where anger is sort of the top 10% that's above the surface, that's easily recognizable, that you can see, right, that you can feel. That is anger, and yet, the top of the iceberg never exists without the bottom. And there's always an emotion that is first and that is primary. For example, just to kind of and play with a few scenarios. One might be if there's a teenager who is particularly just furious with her parents because her mom or her dad has taken a new job, got a new opportunity, but it involves moving the family to an entirely new place. And she's expressing her anger over this move. And that's understandable and the anger is legitimate. And at the same time, the emotion that's most likely primary is sadness. Sadness over the loss of the home that she's known for so long, sadness over the loss of so many relationships, off the loss of her community, right? The, the primary emotion is sadness and the anger arises out of it. I know that uh, when it comes to a lot of couples, fights can, and conflict can arise sort of around the area of finances, right? I'm sure not anyone in here, but out there, that's a common thing for people is to, is to fight uh, about finances. And I think, you know, our relationship with finances is something that can in a lot of ways be complicated. And the way we interpret money, what we uh, sort of attach to it in terms of value and all of that. But uh, one scenario could be that a fight is arising, anger is arising because one person or even both people within the relationship uh, have this fear over the financial situation that they're in. And that fear is what the anger is arising out of. And the anger is making itself known and expressing itself, but underneath the surface, there is fear. And if I could, if I could I'm going out on a limb here a little bit. If I could just share one from my own life. I, I watched this documentary last night that a friend worked on that was, I have permission for my wife to share this. I wanna say that at the start. I have permission. Uh, but I watched this documentary about trail runners. This guy ran the, the Buffalo 100 and like did all 100 miles and it was super inspiring. And so usually when I'm rehearsing on Saturday night, I'll go for a run while I'm working through the sermon. And I was like, man, th this guy busted out 100 miles. I'm gonna see if I can go just a little bit further tonight than what I typically do. And so I got out and it was an out and back trail and I kept going further and I kept going further and the further you go, the further you have to come back. And I did not have my phone with me, and my watch died partway through. I was very unprepared. And uh, basically, I ended up getting home an hour and a half later than I typically do. And when I walked in the door, uh, things were not happy. <laughs> it's probably the best way to put it. And so there was some anger there, uh, justifiably so. I made a very... Uh, a very stupid decision in not communicating and, uh, and in choosing to continue going. But the anger was arising out of fear. I fear that I had been attacked by a mountain lion and was lying you know, but beside a tree somewhere, which honestly is a, is a legitimate fear that I have every time I go out in Utah. But, <laughs> so, so that's the way that anger works. It always arises out of some other emotion that is primary, and the key to understanding anger is being able to explore and answer the question, what is the primary emotion underneath my anger? What is the primary emotion that my anger is arising out of? And I think there's a few ways to get at that, because emotions, you know, they can be difficult, they can be challenging to identify and to understand, and so I think there's a few ways to get at this. One could be, uh, you know, just spending some time kind of processing, whatever helps you to do that, whether it is a run or a walk or a bike ride or a drive or, or even just kind of journaling, right? Taking some paper or opening up a, a Google Doc or something like that and just sort of processing your negative emotions, trying to figure out what's underneath this. But I think one other avenue that is so helpful is relationships. Having a trusted friend whom you trust and respect to be able to work through this. And I wanna be clear here, because I think sometimes we can hesitate to do that because we're afraid of kind of leaning into gossip. And I wanna clarify the difference here. Gossip, if we're honest, it can be a fun thing, right? To kind of speculate about what may or may not be true of someone else's life, 
uh, to think about what their issues might be or might not be. It can be enjoyable to do that for a while, and yet, if you have ever been on the receiving end of that, or if you've ever watched the movie Mean Girls, you know how damaging and destructive it can be, right? That, that gossip can be incredibly destructive. And, and I wanna be clear that this is something else entirely. And in relationships, there's something we can provide for each other that is called containment. Containment is where you allow the other person to vent while staying warm and without reacting. So not reacting in a way that just continues to escalate their anger, not reacting in a way that leads them to uh, be angry in a way that's longer than necessary, but basically being a safe container for the other person to express their emotions, to verbally process what they're going through, and to help them identify what the primary emotion is beneath their anger, to have someone who can play this role in your life, and even to play this role in the lives of others, is an incredibly helpful thing when it comes to working through understanding our anger. And so relationships are key. And I'll say that is true as we kind of draw near to the end here. Relationships are key, both with one another, but also the relationship that Jesus invites each and every one of us into. And if we jump back into that letter from Paul, one of the interesting things is he's giving these, these instructions and how they are to deal with one another. And at the end of it, he flows directly into this very relationship. Jesus, he says this, Ephesians 4.31. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, uh, brawling. I think it's funny that he has to tell them not to brawl. Uh, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. He leans into the relationship they have with Jesus because of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And he leans into that relationship as a model and even a resource for them to help each other navigate their relationships in the very same way. And if I think back to the scene that we watched, there's something really beautiful about the way that Jesus interacts with James and John. Because they're angry, they're upset, and, and they're you know, asking for things that are a little bit ridiculous, and he responds to them by rebuking them, expressing a little bit of anger himself. And yet at the end of it all, the anger didn't blow up their relationships. They are actually able to work through it in such a way that their relationships are even better than they were before the relationship they have with him is actually stronger on the other side of the anger. And I think at the very least, that leads us in the direction of this idea, this gospel truth, that because of the cross, anger can connect us to Jesus. Because of the cross, our anger can actually draw us into an even closer relationship with him. On the one hand, because we know that he's a safe place for us to express our own anger that we can bring our anger to him and work it out in the context of our relationship with him. But also on the other hand, because we can know that whatever anger he feels isn't the anger of a condemning judge, but it's the anger of one who loves us and who wants us to live in light of that love. Because if there is any primary emotion or primary motivation beneath the anger of God, you can be sure that it is love. And we see that in no clearer place than upon the cross itself, where God poured out his anger upon himself so that he would be able to extend to you and I nothing but love. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the time together this morning. Uh, We thank you for the emotional lives that we do have. that we do feel emotions that are there to keep us safe, that are there to give us insight into our lives and relationships, that are there to help us uh, connect with one another and connect with you. And we just ask that you would help us to continue to grow in that, uh, to grow in our relationships with you and with one another, for your glory and for our good. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's message and trusting us with your time. If you'd like to connect with one of our pastors or staff, you can easily do that by visiting smccutah.org slash connect. When you fill out that quick form, they will get back to you within a few days and be able to connect with you. 
As well, if you'd like to know more about taking a next step at SMCC, you can easily look at what next steps we have by visiting smccutah.org slash next steps. And lastly, if you found today's message both hopeful and helpful, I would encourage you to do maybe one of two things. First, you can share this message with someone that would find it helpful. And you can also choose to partner with us financially so that more people can see messages like this. You can find more information on what that looks like by visiting smccutah.org slash give. Again, thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you at one of our locations soon.